This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Kingdom of Childhood, Lecture 4, given in Torquay on August 15, 1924. I have shown you how you should teach with descriptive imaginative pictures between the change of teeth and the ninth or tenth year. For what the children then receive from you will live on in their minds and souls as a natural development, right through their whole lives. This, of course, is possible only if the feelings and ideas you awaken are not dead, but living. To do this, first of all, you yourself must acquire a feeling for the inward life of the soul. Teachers and educators must be patient with their own self-education, with awakening something in the soul that indeed may sprout and grow. You then may be able to make the most wonderful discoveries. But if this is to be so, you must not lose courage in your first endeavors. For you see, whenever you undertake a spiritual activity, you always must be able to bear being clumsy and awkward. People who cannot endure being clumsy and doing things stupidly and imperfectly at first never really will be able to do them perfectly in the end out of their own inner self. And especially in education, first of all, you must kindle in your own souls what you then have to work out for yourselves. But first it must be enkindled in the soul. If once or twice you have succeeded in thinking out a pictorial presentation of a lesson then you see, that you see impresses the children, then you will make a remarkable discovery about yourself. You will see that it becomes easier to invent such pictures, that by degrees you become inventive in a way you had never dreamt of. But for this you must have the courage to be very far from perfect to begin with. Perhaps you will say, you ought never to be a teacher if you have to appear before the children in this awkward manner. But here, indeed, the anthroposophical outlook must help you along. You must say to yourself, something is leading me karmically to the children so that I can be with them as a teacher, though I am still awkward and clumsy. And those before whom it behooves me not to appear clumsy and awkward, those children, I shall only meet in later years, again through the workings of karma. Teachers and educators thus must take up their lives courageously, for in fact the whole question of education is not a question of the teachers at all, but of the children. Let me therefore give you an example of something that can sink into the child's soul so that it grows as the child grows something that you can come back to in later years and use to arouse certain feelings. Nothing is more useful and fruitful in teaching than to give the children something in picture form between the seventh and eighth years, and later perhaps in the fourteenth and fifteenth years to come back to it again in some way or other. Just for this reason, we try to let the children in the Waldorf school remain as long as possible with one teacher. When they come to school at seven years of age, the children are given over to a teacher who then takes the class as far as possible, for it is good that things that at one time were given to the children in germ can again and again furnish the content of the methods used in their education. Now suppose, for instance, that we tell an imaginative story to a child of seven or eight. The child does not need to understand at once all the pictures contained in the story. I will describe later why this is not necessary. All that matters is that the child takes delight in the story, because it is presented with a certain grace and charm. Suppose I were to tell the following story. Once upon a time, in a world where the sun peeped through the branches, there lived a violet, a very modest violet, under a tree with big leaves and the violet was able to look through an opening at the top of the tree. As she looked through this broad opening in the treetop, the violet saw the blue sky. The little violet saw the blue sky for the first time on this morning, because she had only just blossomed. Now the violet was frightened when she saw the blue sky. Indeed, she was overcome with fear. But she did not yet know why she felt such great fear. 
Then a dog ran by, not a good dog, a rather bad snappy dog. And the violet said to the dog, Tell me, what is that up there that is blue like me? For the sky also was blue, just as the violet was. And the dog in his wickedness said, Oh, that is a great giant violet like you, and this great violet has grown so big that it can crush you. Then the violet was more frightened than ever, because she believed that the violet up in the sky had got so big that it could crush her. And the violet folded her little petals together and did not want to look up to the great big violet any more, but hid herself under a big leaf that a puff of wind had just blown down from the tree. There she stayed all day long hiding in her fear from the great big sky violet. When morning came, the violet had not slept at night, all night, for she had spent the night wondering what to think of the great blue sky violet who was said to be coming to crush her. And every moment she was expecting the first blow to come, but it did not come. In the morning the little violet crept out, as she was not in the least tired, for all night long she had only been thinking, and she was fresh and not tired. Violets are tired when they sleep. They are not tired when they don't sleep. And the first thing that the little violet saw was the rising sun and the rosy dawn. And when the violet saw the rosy dawn, she had no fear. It made her glad at heart and happy to see the dawn. As the dawn faded, the pale blue sky gradually appeared again and became bluer and bluer all the time. And the little violet thought again of what the dog had said, that it was a great big violet and it would come and crush her. At that moment a lamb came by, and the little violet again felt she must ask what that thing above her could be. "'What is that up there?' asked the violet. And the lamb said, "'That is a great big violet, blue like yourself.' Then the violet began to be afraid again, and thought she would only hear from the lamb what the wicked dog had told her. But the lamb was good and gentle, and because he had such good gentle eyes, the violet asked again, Dear lamb, do tell me, will the great big violet up there come and crush me? Oh, no, answered the lamb, it will not crush you. That is a great big violet, and his love is much greater than your own love, even as he is much more blue than you are in your little blue form. And the violet understood at once that there was a great big violet who would not crush her, but who was so blue in order that he might have more love, and that the big violet would protect the little violet from everything in the world that might hurt her. Then the little violet felt so happy, because what she saw as blue in the great sky violet appeared to her as divine love, which was streaming toward her from all sides. And the little violet looked up all the time as if she wished to pray to the god of violets. Now, if you tell the children a story of this kind, they will most certainly listen, for they always listen to such things. But you must tell it in the right mood, so that when the children have heard the story, they somehow feel the need to live with it and turn it over inwardly in their souls. This is very important, and it all depends on whether discipline can be maintained in the class through the teacher's own feeling. That is why when we speak of such things, as I have just mentioned, we also must consider this question of keeping discipline. We once had a teacher in the Waldorf School, for instance, who could tell the most wonderful stories, but he did not make such an impression upon the children that they looked up to him with unquestioned love. What was the result? When the first thrilling story had been told, the children immediately wanted a second Then they immediately wanted a third, and the teacher gave in again and prepared a third story for them. And at last it came about that after a time this teacher simply could not prepare enough stories. But we must not be continually pumping into the children like a steam pump. There must be a variation, as we shall hear in a moment. For now we must go further and let the children ask questions. We should be able to see from the children's faces and gestures that they want to ask questions. We allow time for questions, and then talk them over in connection with the story that has just been told. Thus a little child will probably ask, But why did the dog give such a horrid answer? And then in a simple childlike way, you will be able to tell the child that this dog is a creature whose task is to watch, who has to bring fear to people, who is accustomed to make people afraid of him, and you will be able to explain why the dog gave that answer. You can also explain to the children why the lamb gave the answer that he did. 
After telling the above story, you can go on talking to the children like this for some time. Then you will find that one question leads to another and eventually the children will bring up every imaginable kind of question. Your task in all this is to bring into the class the unquestioned authority about which we have still much to say. Otherwise it will happen that while you are speaking to one child, the others begin to play pranks and to be up to all sorts of mischief. And if you are then forced to turn round and give a reprimand, you are lost. Especially with the little children, one must have the gift of letting a great many things pass unnoticed. I greatly admired the way one of our teachers handled the situation. A few years ago he had in his class a regular rascal who has now improved very much. And while the teacher was doing something with one of the children in the front row, the boy leapt out of his seat and gave him a punch from behind. Now, if the teacher had made a great fuss, the boy would have gone on being naughty, but he simply took no notice at all. On certain occasions it is best to take no notice, but to go on working with the child in a positive way. As a general rule, it is very bad indeed to take notice of something that is negative. If you cannot keep order in your class, if you have not this unquestioned authority, I will speak later about this, about how this is to be acquired, then the result will be just as it was in the other case. When the, children, when the teacher in question would tell one story after another and the children were always in a state of tension that could not be relaxed. For whenever the teacher wanted to pass on to something else and to relax the tension, which must be done if the children are not eventually to become bundles of nerves, then one child left his seat and began to play. The next also got up and began to sing. A third did some eurythmy. A fourth hit her neighbor, and another rushed out of the room, and so there was such confusion that it was impossible to bring them together again to hear the next thrilling story. Your ability to deal with all that happens in the classroom, the good as well as the bad, will depend on your own mood of soul. You can experience the strangest things in this connection, and it is mainly a question of whether the teacher has suffered, excuse me, <laughs> has sufficient self-confidence. The teacher must come into the class in a mood of mind and soul that can really find its way into the children's hearts. This can only be attained by knowing your children. You will find that you can acquire the capacity to do this in a comparatively short time, even if you have fifty or more children in a class. You can get to know them all and come to have a picture of them in your mind. You will know each one's temperament, special gifts, outward appearance, and so on. In our teachers' meetings, which are the heart of the whole school life, the single individualities of the children are carefully discussed, and what the teachers themselves learn from their meetings, week by week, is derived first and foremost from this consideration of the children's individualities. In this way the teachers may perfect themselves. The child presents a whole series of riddles, and out of solving these riddles there will grow the feelings that you must carry into the class. When a teacher is not inwardly permeated by what lives in the children, as is sometimes the case, then the children immediately get up to mischief and begin to fight when the lesson has hardly begun. I know things are better here, but I am talking of conditions in Central Europe. This can easily happen, but it is then impossible to go on with a teacher like this, and you have to get another teacher. With a new teacher, the whole class is a model of perfection from the first day. These things may easily come within your experience. It simply depends on whether the teacher is willing to meditate upon the whole group of children with all their peculiarities every morning. You might think that this would take a whole hour. Indeed, if it did take an hour, it would be impossible. But this is not so. In fact, it can be done in ten or fifteen minutes. The teacher must gradually develop an inward perception of each child's mind and soul for this is what will make it possible to see at once what is going on in class. To get the right atmosphere for this pictorial storytelling, you must, above all, have a good understanding of the temperaments of the children. 
This is why the treatment of children, according to temperament, has such an important place in teaching. And you will find that the best way is to begin by seating the children of the same temperament together. In the first place, you have a more comprehensive view, knowing that over there are the cholerics, there the melancholics, and here the sanguines. This will also give you a vantage point from which to know the whole class. The very fact that you do this, that you study the children and seat them according to their temperaments, means that you have done something to yourself that will help you to keep the necessary unquestioned authority in the class. These things usually come from sources you least expect. All teachers and educators must work upon themselves inwardly. If you put the phlegmatics together, they will mutually correct each other, for they will be so bored by one another that they will develop a certain antipathy to their own phlegma, and it will get better and better all the time. The cholerics hit and smack each other, and finally they get tired of the blows they get from the other cholerics, and so the children of each temperament rub each other's corners off extraordinarily well when they sit together. But when the teacher speaks to the children, for instance, when conversing with them about the story that has just been given, the teacher must develop, as a matter of course, the instinctive gift of treating each child according to temperament. Let us say that I have a phlegmatic child. If I wish to talk over with such a child a story like the one I have just told, I must come across as even more phlegmatic than the child. With the sanguine child who is always flitting from one impression to another and cannot hold on to any of them, I must try to pass from one impression to the next even more quickly than the child does. With a choleric child, you must try to teach things in a quick, emphatic way so that you yourself become choleric. And you will see how in the face of your collar the child's own choleric propensities become repugnant to the child. Like must be treated with like, so long as you do not make yourself ridiculous. Thus you will gradually be able to create an atmosphere in which a story like this is not merely related but can be spoken about afterward. But you must speak about it before you let the children retell the story. The very worst method is to tell a story and then to say, uh, Now, Edith Miller, you come out and retell it. There is no sense in this. It only has meaning if you talk about it first for a time, either cleverly or foolishly. You need not always be clever in your classes. You can sometimes be quite foolish, and at first you will mostly be foolish. In this way, the children make the thing their own. And then, if you like, you can get them to tell the story again. But this is of less importance, for indeed it is not so essential that the children should hold such a story in their memory. In fact, for the age of which I am speaking, namely between the change of teeth and the ninth or tenth year, this hardly comes in question at all. Let the children by all means remember what they can, but what has been forgotten is of no consequence. The training of memory can be accomplished in subjects other than storytelling, as I will describe later. But now let us consider the following question. Why did I choose a story with this particular content? It was because the thought pictures that are given in this story can grow with the children. You have all kinds of things in the story that you can come back to later. The violet is afraid because she sees the great big violet above her in the sky. You need not yet explain this to the little child but later, when you are dealing with more complicated teaching matter and the question of fear comes up, you can recall this story. Things small and great are contained in this story, for indeed things small and great are repeatedly coming up again and again in life and working upon each other. Later on, then, you can come back to this. The chief feature of the early part of the story is the snappish advice given by the dog, and later on the kind, loving words of advice uttered by the lamb. And when the child has come to treasure these things and has grown older, how easily, then, you can lead on from the story you told before to thoughts about good and evil, and about such contrasting feelings that are rooted in the human soul. And even with a much older pupil, you can go back to this simple child story, you can make it clear that we are often afraid of things simply because we misunderstand them 
and because they have been presented to us wrongly. This cleavage in the feeling life, which may be spoken of later in connection with this or that lesson, can be demonstrated in the most wonderful way if you come back to this story in the later school years. In the religion lessons, too, which will only come later on, how well this story can be used to show how the child develops religious feeling through what is great. For the great is the protector of the small, and one must develop true religious feelings by finding in oneself those elements of greatness that have a protective impulse. The little violet is a little blue being. The sky is a great blue being, and therefore the sky is the great blue god of the violet. This can be used at various stages in the religion lessons. What a beautiful analogy you can draw later on by showing how the human heart itself is of God. One can then say to the child, Look, this great sky violet, the god of the violets, is all blue and stretches out in all directions. Now think of a little bit cut out of it. That is the little violet. So God is as great as the world ocean. Your soul is a drop in this ocean of God. But as the water of the sea, when it forms a drop, is the same water as the great sea, so your soul is the same as the great God is, only it is one little drop of it. If you find the right pictures, you can work with the child in this way throughout the early years, for you can come back to these pictures again when the child is more mature. But you must find pleasure in this picture-making, and you will see that when, by your own powers of invention, you have worked out a dozen of these stories, then you simply cannot escape them. They come rushing in upon you wherever you may be. For the human soul is like an inexhaustible spring that can pour out its treasures unceasingly as soon as the first impulse has been called forth. But people are so indolent that they will not make the initial effort to bring forth what is there in their souls. We will now consider another branch of this pictorial method of education. We must remember that with the very little child, the intellect that in the adult has its own independent life must not yet really be cultivated, but all thinking should be developed in a pictorial and imaginative way. Now even with children of about eight years of age, you can quite easily do exercises of the following kind. It does not matter if they are clumsy at first. For instance, you draw this figure. There is a drawing. You must try in all kinds of ways to get the children to feel that this is not complete, that something is lacking. How you do this will, of course, depend on the individuality of each child. You could, for instance, say, Look, this goes down to here, left half, but this only comes down to here, right half, incomplete. But this doesn't look nice, coming right down to here and the other side only so far. Thus you will gradually get the child to complete this figure. The child must get the feeling that the figure is unfinished and must be completed. Finally the child will add this line to the figure. I will draw it in red. The child could, of course, do it equally well in white, but I am simply indicating in another color what has to be added. At first the attempts will be extremely clumsy, but gradually, through balancing out the forms, the child will develop observation that is permeated with thought, and thinking that is permeated with imaginative observation. All of the child's thinking will become imagery. And when you have succeeded in getting a few children in the class to complete things in this simple way, you can then go further with them. You can draw some such figure as the following, and there's a second drawing, and after making the children feel that this complicated figure is unfinished, you can induce them to put in what will make it complete, right-hand part of drawing B. In this way you can arouse a feeling for form that will help the children to experience symmetry and harmony. This could be continued still further. You could, for instance, Awaken in the children a feeling for the inner laws governing this figure. And again there's another drawing. They would see that in one place the lines come together, and in another they separate. This closing together and separating again is something that you can easily bring to their experience. 
Then you pass over to the next figure. Another drawing. You make the curved lines straight, with angles, and they then have to make the inner line correspond. It will be a difficult task with children of eight, but especially at this age it is a wonderful achievement if you can get them to do this with all sorts of figures, even if you have shown it to them beforehand. You should get the children to work out the inner lines for themselves. They must bear the same character as the ones in the previous figure, but consist only of straight lines and angles. This is the way to inculcate in the children a real feeling for form, harmony, symmetry, correspondence of lines, and so on. And from this you can pass over to a conception of how an object is reflected. If this, let us say, is the surface of the water, another drawing, and here is some object, you must arouse in the children's minds a picture of how it will be in the reflection. In this manner you can lead the children to perceive other examples of harmony to be found in the world. You can also help the children become skillful and mobile in this pictorial imaginative thinking by saying, touch your right eye with your left hand, touch your right eye with your right hand, touch your left eye with your right hand, touch your left shoulder with your right hand from behind, touch your right shoulder with your left hand, touch your left ear with your right hand, touch the big toe of your right foot with your right hand and so on. You can thus make the children do all kinds of curious exercises. For example, describe a circle with your right hand round the left. Describe a circle with your left hand round the right. Describe two circles cutting each other with both hands. Describe two circles with one hand in one direction and with the other hand in the other direction. Do it faster and faster. Now move the middle finger of your right hand very quickly. Now the thumb. Now the little finger. So the children can learn to do all kinds of exercises in a quite alert manner. What is the result? Doing these exercises when children are eight years old will teach them how to think, to think for the rest of their lives. Learning to think directly through the head is not the kind of thinking that will last for life. It makes people, quote-unquote, thought-tired later on. But if, on the other hand, they have to do actions with their own bodies that need great alertness in carrying out, and that need to be thought over first, then later on they will be wise and prudent in the affairs of life, and there will be a noticeable connection between the wisdom of such people in their thirty-fifth or thirty-sixth year and the exercises they did as a child of six or seven. Thus it is that the different epochs of life are connected with each other, out of such a knowledge of the human being, you must try to work out what you have to bring into your teaching. Similarly, you can achieve certain harmonies in color. Suppose you do an exercise with the child by first of all painting something in red, another drawing. Now show the child in a feeling way that next to this red surface a green surface would be very harmonious. This of course must be carried out with paints, then it is easier to see. Now you can try to explain to the child that you are going to reverse the process. I am going to put the green in here, inside. What will you put round it? Then the child will put red round it. By doing such things, you will gradually lead to a feeling for the harmony of colors. The child comes to see that first I have a red surface here in the middle and green round it. But if the red becomes green, then the green must become red. It is of enormous importance just at this age, toward the eighth year, to let this correspondence of color and form work upon the children. Thus our lessons must all be given a certain inner form, and if such a method of teaching is to thrive, the one thing necessary is to express it negatively, to dispense with the usual timetable. In the Waldorf School we have so-called quote-unquote period teaching, and not a fixed timetable. We take one subject for four to six weeks. The same subject is continued during that time. We do not have from eight to nine arithmetic, nine to ten reading, ten to eleven writing. 
but we take one subject that we pursue continuously in the main lesson, morning by morning, for four weeks. And when the children have gone sufficiently far with that subject, we pass on to another. We never alternate by having arithmetic from eight to nine and reading from nine to ten, but we have arithmetic alone for several weeks, then another subject similarly, according to what it may happen to be. There are, however, certain subjects that I will deal with later that require a regular weekly timetable. But as a rule in the so-called main lessons, we keep very strictly to the method of teaching in periods. During each period we take only one subject, but these lessons can include other topics related to it. We thereby save the children from what can work such harm in their soul life, namely that in one lesson they have to absorb what is then blotted out in the lesson immediately following. The only way to save them from this is to, is to introduce period teaching. Many will no doubt object that in this kind of teaching the children will forget what they have learned. This only applies to certain special subjects, for example arithmetic, and can be corrected by frequent little recapitulations. This question of forgetting is of very little account in most of the subjects. At any rate, in comparison to the enormous gain children will have if we concentrate on one subject for a certain period of time. The end of lecture four.